between us. How high the mountains, I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven, spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, no heart can fathom such boundless grace. When God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame, the cross has spoken. I am forgiven.
stand with us in worship.
to 
Okay, we're good now? I'm settled in, okay? As you know that, uh, many of you know that my parents are divorced um, from when I was really young. So uh, along the, the way, my mom dated uh, guys, you know, not a whole, whole bunch, but she'd had different boyfriends and, uh, before she got remarried. And um, one time, one of the guys that she went out with was a driving instructor. He had his own driving school. And he had a vehicle that had brakes and accelerator on his side, too. I don't think there was an accelerator, but there was brakes and a steering wheel as well. And so we went bowling one time, and he let me drive home from going bowling. Um, and I was probably about 12 years old. In California, it's 16 years old to have a license at the minimum, not 14 like you have here. And we don't have farms, at least I didn't live on a farm, so my driving was on a public street. But he was a driving instructor, so I was good. So I remember driving with him, and there was this one road that we had to go on to get back from the bowling alley to get home. Two lanes, one in either direction, 40 miles an hour. And I felt myself starting to kind of veer a little bit off to the right. And, and, and I didn't really know how to correct it, you know? If you don't know how to drive, you, you don't know what you're supposed to do. Um, and so he would, he would correct that for me. So he said, you don't have to worry about it. I got you, you know? That sort of thing. And if I found myself going too fast, he would tap on the brakes and kind of slow us down. And so I, I share that with you because there are times in life where you just, I, I think you've heard my heart in this before, that um, there are things that you fear that you're, you have the ability to just wreck beyond repair, you know? And when you have somebody who's there who can control the situation and make sure that you get to where you're, where you're going and make sure that it works out well, it's a very comforting feeling. And so I, I bring that in to you with that sort, of, that sort of thought because I think for us as Christians, it's really important as we're walking through this uh, journey uh, of following Christ and discipleship, as we've been going through our study in the book of Mark, it's important for us to know that God is at work in us as well. It's not just reliant on our own ability and on our own strength. It's actually God's faithfulness to carry out what he's begun in us. And so I wanted to remind us this morning to rejoice in God's willingness and ability to sustain us in our discipleship to Jesus. Right? Rejoice in God's willingness and ability to sustain us in our personal discipleship to Jesus. So turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, is, which is where we're going to be this morning. And we're going to continue from where we left off uh, last week, which is in verse 43. Okay. Uh, we talked about Gethsemane last week, if you recall, and we um, were talking about some of the different pressures that each of us feels, and some of those things are very unique to each one of us. But it's, 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 it's a place where we feel that it's a, the danger, the temptation is to, to cave in to the pressure that we feel around us to, for self-preservation or to do what we want as opposed to doing the will of God. So we're picking up here, and this is what happens right after uh, Gethsemane. And Jesus had told his disciples that the betrayer was, was at hand. And so we pick up in verse 43 of Mark chapter 14. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and the speaking was Jesus, he was speaking, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came... He went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him, and they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to, him, to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled." And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. 
And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And as he was, and, excuse me, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Verse 55. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him, to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, One of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. This is God's word. So as we're looking at this account of Jesus and finally uh, being betrayed here by Judas, being arrested, being declared guilty uh, by this court, and seeing how Jesus' disciples um, respond in this pressure-filled situation, I think we see a picture of ourselves a lot of time. Maybe, maybe maybe, Maybe you don't see that of yourself, I'm not sure. But uh, I think most of us, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we know that we failed Jesus. We look at Peter and we look at the other disciples and we think, well, Jesus chose these guys and they must be special. They must be super Christians. Um, but at this time, they're not, nothing super about them. They're pretty, they're pretty much um, human, regular human people. Um, And so as we're looking at at these guys here and and their reaction to the pressure there, I think of myself. I think about the pressures that I feel. I think about my walk of faith with Jesus and how I feel like I fail Jesus often. I feel like my thoughts are not where they should be a lot of times. And when it comes to the work of the Lord even, I think I sometimes I feel like I'd rather just do my own thing and just go off and, 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 and do something like, that doesn't require any thinking or any pressure. And then I go and start to do some hard work with my body, and I realize I can't do that either. So, you know, you ever read that, that the, the parable about the guy, you know, the shrewd manager? And he says, yeah, that he's, you know, he's, he's too, what is it? He's too weak to really go and dig ditches anymore, you know? So he, he's got to watch out for himself that way. And I think about things like that and I'm reminded that, you know, God really is good to us. He's really good to me. He's really good to you, too. And even though we fail him, he remains faithful. And he has the ability and he has the willingness to continue to sustain us in our personal discipleship to Jesus. And I think that's very comforting to know. So let me show you how I come to arrive at this, Okay. So as we see here, the first point, I'll just go right with the first point here. And it says that we can expect persecution and discipleship to Jesus. We can expect persecution and discipleship to Jesus. 
You know, it goes without saying. We all understand that. We know and we can cite verses in the scripture that we say that if I am a follower of Jesus, I can expect to be persecuted. Jesus told his disciples, you're going to be persecuted in the world. Um, it tells us in First Timothy that if we want to live a godly life, we will experience the hardships. So we know that. So, so if that's the case, why are we surprised when we experience hardship? Why do we act like it's something that's foreign to us when it happens, if we're supposed to expect it, if we believe that that's the way it's supposed to be? Well, I think because sometimes our mind's not really locked in. You know, you know how they, uh, if you're watching sports, uh, football at this time of year, you know that the athletes are supposed to be dialed in, they're supposed to be locked in to what they're doing. And if they're distracted in any way, it shows. Okay? And we as believers, we're supposed to have that mindset. We're supposed to be locked in uh, to following Jesus, to being his witnesses. But we can lose our focus and become distracted by especially the things of this world. So expecting persecution and discipleship to Jesus is something that we should do. Verse 43 says here, immediately, Jesus was still talking. Judas comes in because Jesus had just said that Judas is going to be there uh, or that he's coming right now. And so Judas shows up and um, it makes sure to point out this is not some other Judas. This is one of Jesus's close friends here. One of the 12, it tells us, verse 43. And with him, there's a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So why do they show up like this? Jesus has been around teaching in their midst during the daytime, wherever he's been able to talk to them. He's spoken boldly and told them, called them out where they were wrong. So why did they have to come with swords and clubs? What were they expecting him to do? Fight? Resist? Well, it turns out Peter does that a little bit later on. With, uh, we find that out uh, as, we, as we read through here. But they come with, with this big crowd, and the book of John tells us in its account that there is also uh, some Roman soldiers with this group of people too. So they come, and it says it's a crowd, and the word crowd doesn't have to do with anything that is organized really. It's just a group of people, kind of like a, a mob in a way. Um, uh, before we get to this point in the book of Mark, wherever you see that word crowd, it's just referring to a group of people, and it seems to be they're not good or evil. It's just a crowd of people. After this account, or after we get here in, in Mark chapter 14, that word crowd is always used of a mob who wants to do wickedness or evil to Jesus. So there's this crowd. They're there with swords and clubs, and they're with the chief priests and the scribes. Like I said before, the John's account of it shows that there's Roman soldiers there. And it says, now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. So you ever wonder why Judas decided to betray Jesus with a kiss? And, it, and just to be clear, this is just a greeting among men in the Middle East. It's kind of the kiss on both sides, like you see the French people do a lot, you know? Uh, we, we don't do it here. I think, I think some, some traditions talk about a holy kiss where they kiss on the mouth there, men and men as well. Uh, I had a, a, a missionary who was out in uh, Poland. He was a missionary professor. He was out in Poland, and he went to Russia for, for some gathering there. And when they saw him, they said, brother, and they grabbed him, and they kissed him on the mouth. And said, brother. Uh, 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 hi. Right? He recognized that's how they do it, you know, there. So anyway... Here it is. Judas is going to betray Jesus with a, with a kiss, but why a kiss? Why couldn't he just point to them and tell the soldiers, there, here he is, here's this guy. And I think it's because Judas' point in doing this is he wants to betray Jesus. He, he's planned on doing that from way back when. He's had these secret thoughts of doing it. But what he wants to do also is he wants to preserve his sense of respectability, he doesn't want others necessarily to know that he's the one who's betrayed him. Even though Jesus called him out on it already, Judas thinks he's going to play a game here, and he's going to be there, he's going to betray Jesus in this way, and nobody's going to know that it was him. And so that's his, that's his plan. 
So he goes there and he said he had given them this sign. Uh, the one I, I will kiss is the man sees him and lead him away under guard. And so when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him and they laid hands on him and seized him. That would be Jesus. But one of those, verse 47, stood by, uh, drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And like I said, the other gospel accounts point this out that this was Peter and he pulled out his sword and, and he went to fight in this way. And so uh, these guys are there. Uh, Peter is getting ready to try to defend Jesus uh, um, this way physically. And Jesus, uh, it tells us also in the other accounts, told Peter, just put your sword away. Put it away. Stop. This is not the way. This is not what it's about for us. This is not how we're, we're dealing with this. And so Jesus said to them, have you come out of as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me. Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching. You did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And it says, they all left him and fled. So one of the things that we understand here is that um, when we think about persecution, we think about betrayal, it usually happens from within, some group of people who are close to you. I think when you think about people who might have hurt you the most in your relationships, it's people who you were close with, people you trusted, people who you thought had your back, as we say. And for some reason or another, you find out they, they didn't. Or they, who you thought was friendly is not friendly to you. So it might come from those who are considered friendly. It says here that uh, Judas betrayed Jesus and... Um, and the other accounts that we have of this tell us that uh, he felt bad about it. It says that he felt remorse about it. He even gave back the money. But what he didn't do is it doesn't show that he had any sense of repentance. He never humbled himself. He never asked for forgiveness. He never sought the Lord in that regard. He just felt bad about what he did, and he felt like he was going to rectify his his wrongness in his own way, I guess, by hanging himself. And, and I say this to us because I think it's important for us to know, okay, God is the one who sustains us in this, right? We don't do it on our own. First of all, you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ unless you've come to know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, why is that important? Because Judas had spent all this time with Jesus. And the way the account reads here in the scripture is that he didn't really know Jesus. He didn't know him. He didn't know him as the Messiah. He didn't know him as his Lord. He thought he was going to be some general who was going to somehow or another deliver them from the occupation of Rome. But he didn't really know what Jesus was about. And so there are people who go to church every Sunday who don't really know who, who Jesus is. They think they do. They think they know about God. Knowing about God is not the same as knowing him. And so, you know, when you talk about you might feel bad about sin, you might feel bad about the wrong things you've done in your life, but unless you've humbled yourself and you've cried out for forgiveness to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have a relationship with him. Your sin is not taken care of. And so I just want to make sure that everybody understands that for themselves here. Because it's easy to get caught up in the culture and not know the Christ. So here we go. Just kind of continuing on here. Judas did not repent. He felt bad, but it wasn't enough. Okay, we can trust God to help us to handle the situation, the persecution that we'll face in the same way that Jesus gives us a, an example here of how he dealt with it. He didn't get all feisty. He didn't start fighting physically to resist or anything like that. He had been speaking truth to people all along. And in this case, it's the same deal. He says, why do you come out here with clubs and swords? I've been around you all along. And he called them to the wrong that they were doing. They came by night. They came in such a way that they wanted to do something they knew they weren't supposed to do. 
and he called them on it. And so he was always under control. We see that Peter wasn't, okay? He pulls out his sword. Earlier, he had said that he would even die with Jesus. So it looks like he's following through, right? But you know, the discipleship that Christ calls us into is not always the way we think it's supposed to look. We're we're a lot of times willing to fight physically for, for certain things, but we're not willing to just stand our ground spiritually as Christians. And so we have to understand that when we're called to follow after Jesus, we got to understand it's his discipleship that he's leading us into. We are not to be as uh, Jesus, as Peter was here, he's fighting as a soldier, but he's not willing to stand as a disciple. So understand here that, first of all, our first point here is that we are going to face persecution as Christians. We can expect that, okay? Uh, uh, Secondly, as believers, okay, we exchange our shame for the glory of Jesus. What is God doing in our lives as Christians? Come on, help me out, church. What is God doing in our lives as Christians? He is conforming us to the image of Christ. Christ. Thank you. That's not new teaching, right? He's conforming us to the image of Christ, which means what? God is making us more Christ-like. So it's less of us and it's more of Jesus. So when we talk about the glory of Jesus, we're talking about becoming more and more like Christ. So we exchange our our shame for the glory of Jesus. Look at verse 51 and 52. This is really interesting because none of the other gospel accounts have this uh, little part in here about this young man here that's in the garden. It says, verse 51, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And then it just goes on. It doesn't tell you who this guy is. It doesn't tell you what it's all about. And so we, sometimes we think, well, you know, Mark put stuff in that John did. And John has stuff in there that Mark doesn't. And we talked about this before. When you think about the gospel, it's like four authors or four eyewitnesses standing at an intersection in a very busy street. And an accident happens. And they're seeing things from their perspective. And they're describing what they know there. And Mark is is giving us here this young man. Some commentators point out, and they say that this is like Mark's signature on his work. This is him doing what maybe some of these uh, artists had done in the past, where they maybe wrote themselves, uh, assigned their name in the corner of their picture, or maybe they painted their own face on one of the people in the crowd who was there when Jesus was being crucified. That's an interesting idea to think about. It, it's, it works. So it could be Mark kind of giving us a self-confession, if you will, that he was there as well, and he didn't stand with Jesus because it does tell us here in verse 50, and they all left him and fled. Each one of them had told us a little bit earlier uh, in, in um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, chapter here, that they would all stand by Jesus. When Peter said he would stand even if he had to die, and it said they, they all said the same thing, and now all of them have fled. Everybody has run away. And if this is Mark kind of painting himself into the picture, if you will, maybe he was there. Maybe he was a young person who, who, who saw this happen. And it says here, he's got nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, tried to grab him by his clothes, and he was in such a hurry to get out of there, he just ran away naked. And when you think about naked in the Scriptures, naked is about being Bear, laid bare, right? And it's the idea of shame. And so we're seeing that this guy here would rather uh, just, you know, he would just rather be naked in his own shame than stand by Jesus. And that's how we are. Later on, doesn't, doesn't Peter say he doesn't even know who Jesus is because he's worried about himself, saving his own skin? 
Doesn't he say that he even curses himself? It tells us in the scripture there. He says, I don't even know who this guy is because he's just concerned about saving himself. And we try to do that. We try to protect our reputation. We try to protect our own human dignity when the truth of the matter is we need the dignity of God. We need his forgiveness. We need to, be, to recognize that the value of our lives and the importance of who we are is not the importance we place on ourselves. It's the importance God places on us. So one commentator, and this is kind of a newer type of way of thinking at this, and I think literarily it seems to work, has come down and he's saying that this young man who followed him is kind of a picture of all of us. That Mark is doing something here literarily that is identifying each one of us in here and letting us know that the shame that we bear in ourselves is going to be covered with the glory of Jesus. So uh, as we talk about this young man and this idea about a linen cloth, the only other place that a linen cloth, those words, that, that word for linen cloth is used is later on in Mark chapter uh, 15, verse 46, where it's Jesus who is shrouded in this linen shroud, right? He's covered in burial. And so it's like the idea that he's taken this Shame, he's covered himself in it. And then in Mark chapter 16, verse 5, you see a young man who is covered in white. You know, like, remember at the resurrection account, and you see that there's a young man, it tells us in Mark chapter 16, verse 5, but the other accounts in the gospel talk about uh, there was an angel and there was more than one, more than one angel, we presume. But it could have been just a young man and there's an angel. But the idea is that they're covered in this white, this, this glory, and, 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 it, and it's, it seems to be that that may be a way of looking at it as well. So I point that out to us because uh, the reason why I, I, I think it's important for us to understand is because it's true. We do try to cover our own stuff. We do try to cover our own shame. We do try to deal with our own sin. And the, and the truth is, unless you're in Christ, you're uncovered. And so we want to, to recognize that God is the one who is working and has worked to, to make us more like Jesus Christ. He's the one who's, quote unquote, covered over our shame, washed us, uh, made us new, made us white as snow. And, and, and so we want to, to acknowledge that, Okay. He's the one working with us. He's the one that's sustaining us. He's the one who has the ability. We're dependent upon him. Going on here. Um, picking up verse 53. Uh, and they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes uh, came together. So this takes us to our final point here, which is that failure is not final. Okay? Failure is not final in this life I put up there. Uh, because what is final? What is final in this life? Death, okay? But that's what's final, right? Final in, in this life is death. So as long as we still have breath, right, there's still, quote unquote, a chance, okay? And I say that because as Christians, we believe that the Lord holds us in his hand. We recognize that he is the one who has uh, given us our security, but we also understand that there's failures in our lives. There's the failure to stand for God the way that we ought to. Peter is an example of somebody who is in Jesus' inner circle, and he fails Jesus. It says they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes come together. And I know we like to focus on what happens to Jesus here, and, and that's true. Uh, we usually do that during Easter time, right? Good Friday in, in particular. And so we, 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 we see this happening, but look at what's going on with Peter, verse 54. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. Uh, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. So he's right there. So one good thing about Peter is even though he's afraid, he's still following at a distance. Okay? 
He's following at a distance there, and he's sitting with the guards. He's warming himself, verse 55. Now, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they didn't find any. So they don't have any reason to declare him guilty, okay? Uh, Many bore false witness, it tells us in verse 56. I'm sorry, go back there. Verse 56, many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. So they couldn't even corroborate together there. And some, uh, um, some stood up, bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will build another temple without hands, right? Not made with hands. So he didn't say, I will destroy the temple. He said, destroy the temple. He was making a challenge there because they wanted to know who he was and what authority he had. So he says, I will destroy this temple. That's what they were claiming that is made with hands. And in three days, I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. So verse 59 shows us here that they couldn't even agree on this. And so the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent, made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus then said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So who is Jesus claiming to be? The son of man. He's claiming to be the Messiah. He's claiming to be equal with God. And so the high priest tears his garments and says, what further witnesses do we need? So he wants to, he wants to indict Jesus or, or convict Jesus of being um, uh, um, uh, blasphemy. But what's happening there is he's not even explored the evidence. If you're Jewish and you're, and you're a religious leader, who are you expecting to come? You are expecting to come the Messiah, right? So if you're expecting the Messiah to come and somebody says they're, they're the Messiah, do you automatically say, no, they're not? Especially if they're showing themselves to do wonder-working miracles, they're leading people, their teaching is awesome, it's off the chain, and he's got all this charisma, people like him. Wouldn't you explore that more? They determined in themselves that he's not the Messiah they're looking for, and so they declare him guilty. And that's how it went. It was no fair trial. It's not that Jesus was justly uh, convicted or condemned. No way. And so this is what this is what he says. You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? They all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy, and the guards received him with blows. So now they're going to mistreat him now too, right? So, so we're, we're seeing here what's going on. But here we go, verse 66. And Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. And so now you have... This time, Jesus had already foretold this to Peter. He said, before the night is out, before you hear the the cock crow twice, that you are going to deny me three times. And so what does Peter do? He's a puppet, right? Because Jesus predicted it, Peter did not have a choice. Yes or no, people? Okay. He chose to do it himself because he was too concerned about himself. And in it all, it says here that when it's all said and done, verse 72, and immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Because he had failed his master. Where are we? Where are we when we fail Jesus? You know, the good thing about being in Christ, and once again, I tell you that failure is not final in this life, because as long as we're breathing, 
We understand that in our failures, we can come to the Lord and we can ask for forgiveness. Because that's all we got. And that's enough. If you think, well, I, I had always the mindset. I think I told you guys I would, I would disobey my mother. She'd tell me to be home at a certain time. She'd tell me to do something. And if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I just felt like I could just work harder at it next time, and she would be happy because I did twice as much yard work or I did whatever else I wanted to do when I wanted to do it to try to impress her. And somehow or another, I had it within myself to make it all right just by doing that. But you know, when you've messed up, you can't go back and undo it. You don't get that luxury. And so to come clean before the Lord is just to confess what is already evident anyway. I messed up. And the beauty of God is that he knows where we are, and he knows how to restore us. He knows how to sustain us, and he's willing to do that in our discipleship to Jesus. Right? We, we know what end up, ends up happening. We have the account in John chapter 21 where Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Right? He told him, feed my sheep, and he did it three times. Why? Because Peter was hurting there. Peter had the guilty conscience. Peter knew. He was ashamed. But God takes the initiative to restore us. God takes the initiative to sustain us. And so it's important for us to know that as we are trying to walk, as we are walking in discipleship to Jesus, that it's not only in our own strength. It's in the strength that God gives us. It's his willingness. It's his ability to do that. What is our part in it? Our part in it is just to say yes, right? That's our part in it. And so we want to be faithful disciples of Jesus. But in being faithful disciples of Jesus, we know we will fail him. Because every disciple who's ever followed Jesus has failed him in some way, shape, or form. It might not be the dramatic or the drastic like Peter. Like I said, it's those opportunities we have to, to speak up where we are or to listen. Huh? From Sunday school, maybe. To listen as you ask the question, to find where people are, and to speak truth into the situation, to be that witness, to go and, and, and where you would maybe are willing to just let it go and not be that salt and light to actually do that. But God is working at it harder than us. He cares about it more than we do. It's for his glory that he conforms us to the image of Jesus. It's to show his greatness. It's to show his mercy. It's to show his grace. Grace Bible. And so just rejoice. Rejoice that God is willing and he's able to sustain us in faithful discipleship to Jesus.